Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you today? Oh, I heard you. I think I did anyway. How's everybody doing this morning? Awesome. Welcome to Lifeway Community Church. If you are a guest, we are so honored to have you. If you are family, good to see you this morning. We just honor God today. We we bless him. We, 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 we come to lift his name this morning. We come to glorify him. We come to magnify him. Hallelujah. Come on, lift your hands if you love Jesus in the room today. Hallelujah. Lift your hearts if you love Jesus in the room. worthy of any praise, all praise that we can give you, God. Your name be magnified. Your name be glorified. Show yourself mighty today, God. Show yourself strong. Lift the hanging head. Mend the broken heart. Set the captive free. Set the captive free. Some are bound with one thing, some are bound with the other, but God, you are a God that has freedom in your hands. You can set the captive free. You have freedom on your lips. You can say it. You're free, and we will be free. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We count on you, God, today to do exceedingly above, abundantly, all that we can ask all that we can think in the name of Jesus 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 not like our praise. But I choose to put my praise on this morning. Shake off those heavy bands. Lift up holy hands and worship Him. You might not feel like it this morning. But I challenge you to push, push this morning, push beyond yourself. Things might not look good, but I encourage you this morning just to set things aside, set your mindsets aside. Set the things that are to happen this week aside and let's just worship yeah, him this yeah, morning yeah. and see what happens. Amen? Push, yeah. push, push. 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 Yeah. Pray until some.
the tower Cause it won't give up on you Help me say Don't, don't give up on God Cause he won't give up on you Don't give up Don't give up on God Cause he won't give up on you Let that get in your spirit and say it again Don't give up Don't give up on God Cause he won't give up on you One more time, don't give up Don't give up on God Cause he won't give up on you Somebody throw that in the atmosphere Throw it in the atmosphere God is able God is able for you this morning, Jesus. We welcome you in this place. Come and do what you've come to do. Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. Every man will bow down and say you are King. Sun and star, right now, why would you wait? Yes, the world. Yes, the world. We'll bow down and say you are God. Every, every man will bow down and say you are King. Oh, so, so the star right now. Why would we wait? Why would we wait? We praise you now in victory.
we'll sing hallelujah. So we'll sing hallelujah till you come again. Is that you? Yeah. And we'll dance in your presence till you come again. Oh yeah. Sing hallelujah. And we'll sing hallelujah till you come again. <laughs> we'll dance, God. We'll and dance. we'll dance.
saw somewhere this week that it said, you might not be able to stop the storm from coming, but you can choose to dance in the rain. <laughs> But if we just do it, something happens. When the praises go up, what comes down? Blessings. The glory. It just happens. He's so good. He is so good. Shine through the shadow, burn. 
declare Jesus over those issues you're going through. Say Jesus over those prodigals. Jesus over that sickness and disease. We declare Jesus over everything that comes against us. We declare Jesus. Declare Jesus out loud. Begin to shout, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus over our nation. Jesus over this state. Jesus over our city. Jesus over the broken places in our lives. Jesus over every sickness and disease. We declare Jesus. We declare Jesus. to be able to take a bride he travels to the home of that bride 
Sometimes it may be across the town. Sometimes it may be in another district. Sometimes it may be in another state. And in the Hebrew culture, the man, when he asked for the bride's hand in marriage, first of all, the bride has to consent. And when he asked for the bride's hand in marriage, he, he contractually agrees to be able to take care of everything. As a matter of fact, it's very, very costly. In the Hebrew culture, the two of them will share a glass of wine to be able to seal the contract, even though the marriage has not been consummated. And the sharing of that glass of wine, she makes a commitment that from that moment forward, she is his. When she goes in the marketplace, she's no longer a single looking for a mate, which everyone knows that she has taken. The bridegroom goes back to his place of residency. He begins to prepare a place for her. Sometimes it can take over a year's time as he begins to prepare a home for her. And during that time of preparation, he sends her a gift. It's called a mohar. It's a precious gift. It's a costly gift. It's a gift that helps her prepare herself for him. That mohar could be a very precious ointment. It could be oils. Something that helps prepare her for him. Well, we know inside of the scriptures that we are the bridegroom. And our bride, or our bride, or excuse me, we're the bride, but our bridegroom is the one that we're singing to. And we know that when he made a journey to be able to ask for our hand in marriage, he made a very long journey from heaven all the way to earth. And the endowment that he brought for that contractual agreement was very costly. It was his life. And not only was it his life, but he shed his blood. And when we take Holy Communion, we do it in remembrance of him. He turned to his disciples and he says, it's expedient for me to go away, but I'll send another, a mohar. A precious gift sent to be able to help prepare you for the time that you'll spend with him. See, I think sometimes in American Christianity, we don't understand intimacy. We don't understand the loving relationship that God wants to have with us. We call ourselves Christians because we've accepted Christ. But for many, we never go deeper. We never develop that level of intimacy. But just like in the natural realm, what causes marriages to flourish is true levels of intimacy. You know, you've heard me say in times past that intimacy broken down is into me, you see. Literally pulling back the veil, being candid, being honest, allowing the strength of the union to be able to strengthen the whole. Well, this morning, I really feel like our Heavenly Father wants you to be able to just close your eyes for a minute. I believe he wants to give us a new level of intimacy. I think sometimes the enemy lies to us and gets us to be able to think that God is upset with us. He's angry with us. And the fact of the matter is that's the furthest thing from the truth. Father, I ask that this morning that you move in and out of these rows, up and down these aisles. Father, Lord, you move into every living room. Father, Lord, every workspace, every automobile, wherever, Father, Lord, they are watching this rebroadcast or broadcast from. God, we're thankful that you are an ever-present help in time of need. We're thankful, Father, that we can feel, feel your tangible presence here in this building this morning. And Father, I ask, God, that you would cause each and every one of us to be able to enter into a new realm of intimacy with you. That we would understand, God, to a greater capacity that you would love us with an everlasting love. That we would understand, Father, Lord, that from the foundation of the earth, of the world, Father, Lord, you knew us already made preparation and plans for our success. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the gift of the Mohar of the Holy Spirit to be able to come and help develop us so that we could walk, Father, Lord, not as one that's still looking, but one that's already taken. That we can walk with our shoulders back, our heads held high because we're a bridegroom. We're a child of the King. That, Father, Lord, you love us with an everlasting love. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you move throughout this auditorium and you touch the hearts of your people. Stir them up. There's gifts that you have placed on the inside of them that for some they have laid dormant. And God, you are calling them to be able to pick those gifts up, to activate those gifts, to be able to flow in those gifts because those gifts 
Father Lord, bring refreshing to everyone that unwraps them. We love you today, Father. Holy Spirit, have your way in us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. This side, you can sit down. This side's already kind of got the memo. <laughs> Listen, I got a couple announcements from you. Be Debbie, go ahead and stand up. So Debbie is getting ready next Saturday to be able to start a women's workout group. And so after service, if you'll just meet her over here on my left, she's going to give you all the details. But let me say something, ladies. There's room there for everybody. So it doesn't matter if you're young and you're very active. It doesn't matter if you're middle-aged. It doesn't matter if you're in your senior years. You know, there's, there's room for everybody. And what's awesome is that it's going to be very encouraging. It's going to be very uplifting. It's not going to be co-ed. I know you guys are thinking about, hey, what about us? We need to get in shape. Well, guys, let me tell you something. Round is a shape. Listen, you can come and have breakfast with us on Saturday mornings. Mike's doing a fantastic job. As a matter of fact, we're heading into a new series on Right Now Media. How many of you already have a subscription to Right Now Media? All right, if you don't have your hand up, we, we're offering you a free subscription to Right Now Media. Some 25,000 videos that can help strengthen your relationship with God, strengthen your relationship with each other, strengthen your relationship with your kids. It will, they, got, they got videos in there for finances. Every area of life, and if you'll just fill out one of these little um, connection cards in the very back, put it into the offering plate, you'll get an email. And in that email, all you have to do is accept it, and then they'll ask you to set up a username and password. And did I tell you it's for free? How many of you know that sometimes when people offer you something free, it's not really free? They might give you 90 days free, then all of a sudden you realize that all of a sudden your, 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 your charge card is being charged because, you know, you thought you got something free, and then you realize that now they're charging me. But I'm telling you, this is free. This is a gift from the church. The church pays that subscription every single year, and this, is, and this is a free gift for you. But it's not just for you. If you turn and say, Pastor, I've got children that live in other states, can they also take advantage of Right Now Media? The answer is yes. So just put their email address on there. Secondly, how many of you know that we're going to the Holy Land? Well, you're thinking, my gosh, Pastor, you just got back from the Holy Land. <laughs> Let me say something to you. Lifeway is going to Israel. And there's nothing like studying the, 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 the Word of God in the land of the Bible. You know, a lot of our worship team is going to be going, and it's going to be just power-packed while we're there. But also, it's going to be very prophetic. You know, the land of Israel is very prophetic. You know, the Word of God is very prophetic. All throughout the Word, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, it just deals with biblical prophecy. And, you know, what happens when you're traveling through the land and you begin to see God's prophecy fulfilled, all of a sudden you realize that God is the God of His Word. And for some of us, you know, until we're there, until we're studying it, until we're feeling the presence of God, and I wish I could explain this to you, but I really can't. I know inside of my heart, you know, it, it talks about Jerusalem, that, that you know, it's, it's God's holy city. There are people that say that Jerusalem is like an, order, uh, an open portal from heaven. There's something about Jerusalem that literally causes us to be able to feel the presence of God in a greater capacity. And I'm just telling you that if you've ever wanted to go to Israel, this is the time to be able to go. Well, how do you go? You get one of those brochures in the back, you fill it out, a $200 deposit will hold your spot, and you know what? You have all the way to October 1st. If you come to me on the 30th of September and say, Pastor, I don't think I can make it, it doesn't matter. You get a full refund. And so, but I really believe that, that this trip is going to be filled up fast because the word's getting out, but I want Lifeway to have the first opportunity to be able to get on board. So if you're wanting to be able to go, turn to your neighbor and say, fill that thing out today. You need a passport. It's got to have at least six months activity left on it from when we return. If you don't have a passport, just put on your application applying for whatever it may be and get on it. They're saying that it takes up to 18 weeks now for a passport to be able to come back. COVID. Go figure. I don't know what's happening. You know, you think they had the same amount of employees, but whatever, whatever. Turn to your neighbor and say, whatever. And so get all that filled out. Make sure you see Debbie afterwards because, there, you know, there's something about, you know, the Bible, the Bible says that physical exercise profits. I know you're thinking a little, but it still profits. See here afterwards. It'll be good. Amen. If you've got your Bibles with you, turn over to the eighth chapter of the book of Genesis. I've got this thing burning on the inside of me, and I can't wait to be able to preach it. I've been just chewing on this thing for weeks, and I feel like now is the time. Turn to your neighbor and say, Buckle up, buttercup. Genesis chapter 8. Let's pick up in verse 22. It says, while the earth remains, 
seed time and harvest, cold and wheat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. So this scripture is written right after the flood. Now it's speaking on the aftermath of the flood. And here God is, is literally telling Noah that, that there are times and seasons that while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. You know, this morning I want to be able to preach on the power of the blood to break cycles. Here he's telling Noah that there are cycles inside of the natural realm. And how many of you know what happens in the natural realm also mirrors our spiritual life? So we know there's cycles. How many of you are thankful we're coming out of winter? I came back from Israel and my wife turned to me and she said, our yard is a mess. And, 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 and you know what? And it was only because when I left to go to Israel, we still were in the tail end of winter. And when we came out of Israel, what took place? Spring had come. And you know what? My bushes, they, they exploded like eight inches while I was over in Israel. And, and weeds, golly, I had all kinds of weeds in my yard. And, but we're dealing with it. Turn to your neighbor and say, Pastor's dealing with it. So it's important to understand that everything will be governed by cycles. In Ecclesiastes 3, it says that there's a time and a season for everything under the heavens. So it's important to understand that everything has a cyclical motion. There are things inside of our lives that go through seasons. We understand the natural realm. We understand day and night. We understand that, you know what, it's 1120 right now. And I'm around 830 tonight. The sun's going to be able to set and the darkness is going to be able to come. We understand that. We live in a, in a world that has cyclical cycles. And so it's important to understand that and to understand that, that even though the seasons come, turn your neighbor and say, they also go. Genesis chapter 1. God is, is talking in verse 11, and he says, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herbs that yield seed, the fruit trees that yield fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and the herb that yielded seed according to its kind, and the tree that yielded fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Once again, it's talking about everything operates in cycles. Remember Psalms 1 where it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the, in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's seasonal. You know, oranges only come during orange season. I've got fruit trees right now on the side of my yard that are barren. Or bear, no, they're not bearing, they're barren. So they don't have any fruit. So it's important for us to understand there's times and there's seasons. But as it pertains to us spiritually, you know, it's, what we're talking about as it pertains to time is not chronos. It's not the time on our watch. It's kairos, a strategic time, strategic moments. There are times that, that, that exist with inside of seasons in our lives and they're kairos moments. They're specific times by God that he's calling us to be able to, to move into to new areas, new arenas. Um, and so it's important for us to understand that everything inside of our life is cyclical. It comes and it goes. It's here for a while and then it leaves. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's not here to stay, but it's here to leave. You see, I'm not saying that everything is coming to stay. I'm saying that everything is coming to pass. One of my favorite phrases inside the Bible is that it came to pass. And it moves through cycles. Everything is moving through seasons. And we bring forth fruit with inside of that season. So let me see if I can drill down a little bit on this. How many of you know in every season there should be fruit inside of that season? So when we go through a season like right now, my fruit trees are not bearing fruit. But you know what they are bearing? Buds. As a matter of fact, I've been praying for my, my um, um, satsuma tree because my satsuma tree is only about this tall, about this wide, and she's got about a thousand buds on that satsuma tree. And I know if she bears forth that fruit on that satsuma tree based upon those buds, she's going to be under stress because she's going to have a lot of fruit and them limbs are going to be on the ground. But you know, there's times in their season, so this is of harvesting the fruit. This is a season where the, 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 the satsuma plant is preparing for the fruit. So there are seasons for everything. So sometimes as we begin to understand about seed time and harvest, as we begin to understand how God's kingdom works, 
you need to understand that some things are sowed. How many of you know that God doesn't come out every spring and say, let there be grass? He's already said it once. So what does the grass do? The grass reproduces after its kind. So the grass has seeds with inside of it, and those seeds um, begin to produce more grass. You know, some of you love those little dandelions. Is that what they're called, those little things that you blow on? And those little rascals go all over the place? Well, some of you all been blowing those things into my yard because I got weeds everywhere inside of my yard. And, and, and you know what's amazing is I didn't plant those weeds. But you know what? Those weeds came from other weeds, and they began to scatter their seed. Whether it was through the, the air, the wind, whether it was through the lawnmower. You know, I think it's awesome to be able to have my next door neighbors cutting their grass. But, you know, when they turn that, that, that open shoot towards my house, you know what they're doing? They're shooting all of their weeds, all of their seeds into my grass. You better turn to your neighbor and say, you better turn that thing the other way. And so every, everything produces of itself. And so we see in the natural realm, um, um, grass, seeds, um, oak trees, pine trees, um, palm trees, they all reproduce after themselves. I've got Sega palms in my yard, and those Sega palms, I've got one Sega palm, and I think it's just, it's just confused. Because, you know, most of my Sega palms, you know, they grow up and they're beautiful and they've got really nice palms that continually come out. Then I got this one that's got this big cluster in the middle. And I can't figure out what this cluster is, but all I know is it's got probably a thousand little tiny nuts inside of it. And those nuts on that, on that Sega palm, they, those things fall to the ground and all of a sudden I got little Sega palms all around it. And I got to get out there this spring. I haven't worked in my backyard yet. Turn to your neighbor and say, hey, pastor needs some help. I'll have a sign-up sheet out there in the back, you know, when you leave. And, I, and I'll get, and I'll trim those sacred palms back. You know what I got to do? I got to get down my hands and knees down in the dirt. Thank you, Adam. If it wasn't for Adam, I would not have had to get down in the dirt. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. But all of a sudden, I have to get down in the dirt, and I got to pull up all of those little shoots that are coming up. Because if not, my backyard will be a mess, just full of just thousands of little sacred plants. Why? Because they're reproducing after their own kind. And so it's important for us to understand that we reproduce after our own kind. I have pastors sometimes tell me, they say, man, I watch your service online. Man, I love the worship at Lifeway. And, uh, and I turn and I say, man, I love it too. And they're like, well, how do I get that worship at Lifeway for me? And I, and I recognize something. We reproduce after our own kind. I, I, I don't know how y'all worship because I never turn around to look. But all I know is every Sunday I'm on the front row and I'm giving it my all. Because I'm a worshiper. And I love worship. And so I turn to these pastors and I say, listen, if you want to have phenomenal, phenomenal radical worshiper, you've got to be able to plant good seeds in, into the ground. It amazes me when I go to conferences and all of a sudden the guest speaker's sitting on the front row and he's not even worshiping. You know what I recognize is that, you know, he doesn't recognize that the power of worship. Let me say something to you. You know, there are some Sundays when I stand up here, and it's like, if I can use the analogy of a bowling alley, there's some Sundays up here that the Spirit of God has already knocked down um, nine pins, and the tenth pin is just... You know why? Because he's already touched your heart. He's already done a work inside of you. And it's amazing to me how many Sundays that I'll preach, and all of a sudden the emphasis is already there, um, framing my message before I ever deliver my message. And I don't turn to Johnny. I don't turn to Josh. I don't, turn to any, I don't give my wife notes to slip them to the worship team to say, hey, do these songs, do these songs. But it's amazing how the Spirit of God puts things together. But if we want to have certain things inside of our lives, we've got to become certain things in our lives. I tell pastors all the time, it doesn't matter what you preach. Because your preaching or your teaching doesn't necessarily mean who you are. Remember when we did that series on, and I think I'm still in this series, I don't know, I've never stopped it. <laughs> on it's, it's time for change. And, and, and I talked about how the Bible says that, that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he that our think determines our is, but that word heart, it comes from the Hebrew word sub, which literally determines our subconscious. So who we are, who we see ourselves is really who we are. You know, we may turn and I may tell you something. It's amazing. Some Sundays I'm preaching to myself. So don't ever think because I got the microphone that what I'm preaching I've arrived in. Don't ever think that I've perfected these areas. No, most of this stuff that's coming to you is because God's dealing with me on the inside with it first. But all of a sudden, we've got to be able to realize that it's more than just teaching something. We've got to be able to let it be who we are. So we can teach on worship and not be a worshiper. We can teach on praise and never praise. We can teach on prayer and never pray. It amazes to me. Well, I'm about to get myself in trouble. 
I've had preachers that have been pastoring for over a decade call and say, man, can you send me an outline? I have to be able, because of COVID, I have to be able to hold prayer meetings, and I've never held a prayer meeting. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, good God Almighty, you better find yourself another job. But, there, but you can teach on prayer and never pray. We have to understand something, that there are seed times in harvest, and what we do determines what we become inside of that season. There are, there are, are byproducts of seasons that we go through. Now, when we plant, all of a sudden we reap. And we're going to get into it in a minute because sometimes we plant good seeds and sometimes we don't plant so good seeds. Turn to your neighbor and say, why is he looking down? Because I don't want you to think I'm talking about you. <laughs> you know what's amazing is that we all go through seasons. You know what I love is I go to the doctor and you know what the doctor begins to talk to me about? The doctor doesn't care about me. When the doctor begins to hit me with all kinds of questions, you know what he's talking about? My family. He begins to ask me questions if there's any, any um, family members that have ever had cancer. He begins to ask me, is there any family members that have issues with diabetes? Is there any family members that have issues with high blood pressure? Because you know what he's recognizing is that inside of all of us, there are seasons. There are cyclical seasons. And just like orange trees produce oranges, I can't go out there and lay my hands on my orange tree and ask that tree to be able to produce a grapefruit because it produces after its own kind. So when the doctors have figured all this out, so when I go to the doctors and he's asking medical questions to me, he realizes what? After my own kind. So if there's a, 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 um, a, some family history that is there, he wants to know what that family history is. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's what we're going to deal with. Amen? But he wants to be able to know, is there anything that's there? He wants to be able to recognize, is there any type of generational issues? And you know what's amazing is that David and Teresa can testify to this. A lot of times when we come to the altar and we're praying for the sick at the altar, sometimes we're praying for generational sickness. We're praying for sickness that's been in their mama, been in their grandma, been in their grandpa, been in their great-grandma, things that have been passed down. And it's amazing how the enemy can capitalize on that. I don't even know why I'm in this right now. But how the enemy can capitalize on that. And all of a sudden, you know what takes place is that all of a sudden you realize that, man, mama, she, she got sick when she was in her 40s. Grandma, she got sick when she was in her 40s. Great-grandma, she died when she was 47. And you know what the person starts to believe? It's only a matter of time. This thing's going to get me too. And so it's important to be able to recognize that there are cycles in our lives. It's important to recognize that there are seed time and harvest. That some of the things that we're harvesting today is because somebody else planted a seed. Here's where we're going to start getting deep. Everybody has to be able to understand that we go through seasons, but God wants to be able to break those seasons off. You know what I love is that there was a woman in Samaria. You remember the woman at the well? And Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, you know, I must go into Samaria. Well, for those of you that don't understand, that was a no-no because Samaritans were half-breeds. Israelites, Hebrews, did not deal with the people from Samaria because who the Samaritans were, they were people of their tribe that went and married Gentiles over in Samaria. And so good, good Hebrews, good, good Jewish people did not mess with the Samaritans. But he turned to his disciples and said, i got to go to Samaria. So he goes and he sends the disciples into the city to be able to get some supplies. And he's at a well. And a woman comes to the well by herself. She's the only one there. You know why she's the only one there? It's because she would not come around the other women inside of that community. Why? Because she had been married five times. And now she is living with the sixth man. But how many of you know the seventh man showed up? And seven is the number for perfection. And when the seventh man showed up, all of a sudden everything changed. All of a sudden the, 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 the curses that were sown into her life, all of a sudden the, the promises that were made that were broken, all of a sudden now everything begins to change. Because with God, who is the man of perfection, all of a sudden we realize that our lives are found in him. They're not found in the generational curses that can be passed down. I told you this last week, that you know what, our parents may have made us, but our God created us. And he knew us before the foundation of the world. And here's where today we're going to start getting into the importance of understanding that we're created. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a new creation. Old things are past. Behold, all things have been made new. Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that... Um, You know, there's some things inside of our lives that we've got to be careful not to, um, not to plant. 
You know, when you come to my house, I'm not going to, to Ralph Tish and asking Ralph, Ralph, can you give me a bag of weed seed? Because I do not want to plant any weeds inside of my life. And there are some things inside of the church that we don't want planted because, you know, the enemy knows how to be able to plant people around us for the purpose of destroying us. Well, if each and every one of us have a purpose from God, if, if God has determined that, pur that purpose from the foundation of the world, we want to grow in that purpose. We want to reproduce after the, 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 the seed from God, not from the seed of the earth. But, you know, we live in a society today that always wants to dumb down the spirit of God. But I love the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul didn't mix any words. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, here's a verse that you don't hear, ever hear preached on anymore. It's talking about rebellious people inside the church and putting them outside the church. Kicking them outside the church. How many times have you been to a church lately they kick somebody out? No, most people are trying to do all they can to get every, every seat filled. And they'll do whatever. They'll compromise the gospel to be able to get every seat filled. But the Bible, Corinthians, is talking about putting somebody out of the church. Now, he's not talking about being mean to the church. You know what he's talking about? Not, that's not necessarily just putting the person out, but protecting the people that are there. Protecting the flock. Because, you know, everything that we do produces something. You know, the Bible says that there's life and death in the power of the tongue. How many of you know that your tongue, the words you speak, are seeds? What did God do when he framed the universe? He spoke. And, you know, here I was talking to you about um, in the book of Genesis, you know, here all of a sudden now Adam's having to toil by the sweat of his brow in the garden because of rebellion. And how many of you know God never intended Adam to toil by the sweat of his brow in the garden? God intended Adam just to speak to the garden. He never had a problem with weeds. He never had... You wait till I get to heaven. All these weeds I've pulled, I'm going to talk to Adam about it. He never had a problem with weeds until he got rebellious. He never had a problem with thorns until he got rebellious. He never had to work to God. How about you ladies? You know what? They didn't have childbirth and back then. I don't know how you women would have, would, have, would have produced an heir if you didn't have to be able to go through labor. But I'm just telling you right now, it wouldn't have been uncomfortable. There wouldn't have been any pain that came along it. Maybe all of a sudden you would turn to Adam and say, Adam, I want a son. Okay, what do you want him to look like? And you know, all of a sudden he would speak it, son. Boom. And all of a sudden he'd be there. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Bible doesn't say, but when I get to heaven, I'm going to go to AMC in heaven. And I'm going to find out, hey, what would it have been like if these people had not messed up? But all I know back then is that Adam had complete authority in the, in the garden. And just like God, because he was made in the image of God, he spoke. So all of a sudden, we find that rebellion comes into his life. And now Adam is no longer made in the image of God. And how do we know that? Because Adam begins to have sons. And the Bible says that in, in Genesis chapter 5... That, that these sons were made in the image of Adam after his likeness. Why? Because he was no longer after God's likeness because he rebelled against God. So every seed produces after its kind. There's cycles. It's cyclical. And here all of a sudden we realize that God wants to be able to cause good seed to be able to come inside of our lives. You know, a seed produces after its kind. I love what God said to Abraham. God told Abraham that from your seed, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Can you imagine what it would be like to have a blessing inside of your life that reaches 6,000 years? Can you imagine what it would be like that, that here he tells Abraham, Abraham, everybody that blesses you is going to be blessed. Everybody that curses you is going to be cursed. That's why we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's why we pray for, for Israel. Because God says that if you, if you pray for them, you'll be blessed. But if you curse them, you're going to be cursed. Listen, let me just say this to you. Be careful what you speak about people. Be careful if you want to be able to speak something negative about a, a blessed person. Because that thing's going to become like a mirror. And that curse you try to be able to speak about a blessed person, all of a sudden it's going to come right back onto you. But if you bless people, all of a sudden that same blessing comes back onto you. You see, we're made in the image of God. So we have to take on the very character and the very nature of God. And by taking on the character and nature of God, all of a sudden we begin to speak life, 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 life. You know, when I was in Israel, I shot a, a, a video, I don't think it's, it's aired yet, on um, the Jordan River and how the Jordan River flows from up in Mount Hermon and it starts as, as little tiny tributaries that, that form streams and from the streams they, they flow together from the, from, from the Dan and from Caesarea Philippi and they form the Jordan River and the Jordan River comes into the Sea of Galilee on the north. And then it exits on the south and goes all the way down to the Dead Sea. But you know, one of the things I recognize about the Jordan River, in the Greek it's called the Yarden. It's a descender. 
And the thing that I recognize is that our God is the ultimate descender. Remember I was telling you about the, the bridegroom and how he descended from his place in heaven to be able to come to earth. And how he, he gave a, an incredible dowry. And so the Yarden is also known as the descender. And so it descends from the highest height. It brings life. How many of you like to be around people that are encouraging? People that speak the best about you and to speak the best to you, but also speak the best about you to other people. You know what? Uh, my wife must have slipped something in my coffee today. I find out a lot about people by listening to them. Because you know what I recognize is that if you talk to me about somebody else, you'll talk to somebody else about me. And we've got to come to a point where we realize that just like seed time and harvest, some things are generational. So we're not just sowing a seed that's going to affect our generation, but we're sowing a seed that's going to affect multiple generations. You know, my fruit trees on the side of my house, I've had those trees for six years. So I've been reaping fruit from those. Some of you have been eating my kumquats because that, that crazy bush that I have, it produces thousands of kumquats. And you know what? But I'm reaping um, fruit from that for multiple years. And, and you know what? And I'm believing I'm going to reap from those trees for the rest of my life. Well, things that we do in our life, it affects our children, our grandchildren, and, and, and generations to come. And at the same time, things that our parents did, our grandparents did, our great-grandparents did, it's, 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 it's from the Word of God that says that the sins of our forefathers can be carried out to the third and the fourth generation. Turn to your neighbor and say, there's seasons in life. There's some things that you're battling with that you don't even know where they came from. There's some things that you're battling with that maybe your great-grandpa was battling with and he never told anybody about it. And all of a sudden he was planting some seeds. Or, or maybe all of a sudden, you know, your great-grandma, she, she had a business transaction that didn't go real well. Maybe she cut the legs out from underneath somebody and you're wondering why every time you put seed into the ground that that seed is aborted. Because it's important to understand that sometimes we have seed inside of our lives, we have seasons inside of our lives, we have fruit inside of our lives that need to be dealt with. Now I'm getting ready to get good on y'all. Remember I told you this is about the blood of Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and say, oh, here's how we're going to deal with this thing. It's important to be able to recognize that the blood covers it all. How many of you know the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins? I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for the blood. I'm thankful that I don't have to get qualified in order to be able to get loved by God. I'm thankful that, 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 that he accepted me for who I am, and it's not based upon my performance. It's not based upon my church attendance, how much money I want to give in the offering. It's not based upon any of that. It's based upon who he is, and he's a God of love. And I'm so thankful for that. But without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And so when we accept Christ and we ask him to be able to forgive us for, of our sins, you know, our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. But sometimes in our lives, we've got to be able to allow this thing to begin to affect us and to begin to change some of the methodology that was raised inside of us. Now, some of you have heard me say that I never met my biological father until I was 23 years old. I wrote some things down somewhere in here. Where, where is I at? I thought I, I thought I did a pretty good job with it. Uh, maybe I didn't. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I wrote it. Maybe I didn't. Oh, here it is right here. Praise the Lord, somebody. So my biological father, who's a part of my seed, because I came from him, you know, when, when my mom and him, you know, got together, all of a sudden he impregnated her with his seed. So my biological father struggled with some things. He struggled with abusing himself and abusing others. He was drunk every day of his adult life. He squandered fortunes. He destroyed his, not just his family, but families, plural. Most likely, if God didn't intervene, he busted hell wide open. That's a part of my heritage. It's a part of my lineage. But when I came to Christ, all of a sudden, the blood cleansed me. The blood washed me away. Now, I say it like this, that you know what? You can't conquer what you won't confront, and you won't confront what you won't identify. So the reason why I wrote these things, because it's important for me to identify these things. What's important for me is to be able to recognize some of the curses that, that were placed that trickle down from generation to generation. That's why the Bible says to the third, third and fourth generation. You just can't sit back and just casually think that, you know what, I don't have to do anything with this. You have to understand that Christianity is, is, is something that we aggressively have to pursue. 
The scripture says that the kingdom of God suffereth violence, and it's the violent that take it by force. Sometimes you have to get militant, Pasita, and, and, and to be able to understand that, you know what, if you're going to win this thing, you're going to have to get serious with this thing. Well, how do you get serious with this thing? And all of a sudden, I recognize that, you know what, that's no longer part of my heritage. That's no longer part of my seed. But I have siblings that still struggle with the same stuff. I have siblings that, you know, have every one of them been divorced. I have siblings that drink themselves drunk every single night before they go to bed. I have siblings that are walking in the footsteps of their biological father. But in Christ, all is made new. The blood of Jesus can break every curse. The blood of Jesus can turn everything around. But it's important for us to be able to recognize that. And it's important for us to understand that not only does he want to break curses, but he wants to instill blessing. I love this whole concept of Abraham that for thousands of years people were blessed. And guess what? That blessing went from, from 6,000 years ago all the way down to 2022. And it has blessed a man by the name of Eli Hendricks. And I'm thankful that yeah, I grabbed hold of that thing. And I'm thankful that I believe that thing. I'm not going to believe the seeds that were sown inside of me from, from, from years past or from other people's opinions or from maybe from my father squandering great fortunes. No, I recognize that that's not a part of my DNA anymore. My DNA comes from heaven. My DNA comes from my heavenly father. I'm thankful for his blood. I'm thankful that, that every single day that, that it is a new day, that I'm a new creation in him. And at times where I mess up, I know I'm the only one in the building. I can approach his throne of grace and find mercy. I can turn and say, Father, forgive me for that. The things that I've said, God, I pray that you cause those seeds to die in the ground. May they not produce a harvest. May they not affect my family. May they not affect my church. May they not affect my community. I pray that God, you would cause that seed not to germinate in the ground. And guess what he says? Oh, my blood's got that. And that's all it takes is a drop from his blood. The Bible says as far as the east is from the west, he removes our transgressions. You know what that word remove means? Remove. It ain't ever coming back. It ain't ever popping through the ground. It ain't ever, it's never going to be able to deal with, with, with me again. But it's important for us to be able to recognize that he puts these things in place, but we've got to be able to recognize it. So all of a sudden, I turn and I recognize, like it says in Exodus, our forefathers are carried out to the third and fourth generation. And as a result of that, I've dealt with some things. Now, am I done dealing with things? No, absolutely not. You know, even now, the Word of God is a light. The Bible says that the Word is a light unto our, our, our path and it illuminates, Father, the steps of a righteous man. But what's important for us is to allow that Word to be able to do that. So we can't be just casual in our Christianity. We just can't be casual in our relationship with God. We've got to be people of the Word. This is more than just a religious book. You know what this is? This Bible says, the Bible says this is alive. It's sharper than a double-edged sword, able to divide between the soul and the spirit, the joint and the marrow. So this is the thing that helps give me victory in life. This is the thing that, that shows me things like I had generational curses. This is the thing that shows me that, yes, those things died at the cross. And, and because I've accepted um, the, 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 the love of God, the, the, the blood sacrifice on Calvary's Hill, now all of a sudden I'm healed, I'm made whole, I have a sound mind, I'm, I'm not given to a spirit of fear, but I have love and power, and, and, and I have the victory every single day because of the Spirit of God. But we've got to be able to walk in it. But we reproduce after our own kinds. So all of a sudden, I, re I reproduce in my kids. How'd they get their eyes? Well, they got it either through my DNA or my wife's. You know, sometimes, you know what, our kids, you know, they didn't get those long fingers or that blonde hair or those long legs or that short body from just osmosis. They got it through our DNA. But guess what else they got through our DNA? They got some of our characteristics. They got some of our dark habits. Some of our flaws in the flesh. That's why you hear people say, oh, you're a chip off the old block. You look just like your daddy and you act just like your daddy. You know what's amazing? Is it's important for us to be able to talk about this. Because God wants to be able to break those things. He wants to be able to break those cycles. Come and help me, Johnny. He wants us to be able to understand that blessing is his plan. Cursing is not his plan. His, his plan from the very beginning was to be able to bless Adam and Eve and their offspring. Can you imagine what it would be like today if, we, if, they didn't, if they didn't rebel against God? Can you imagine what it would have been like today when all of a sudden our parents would have, would have just spoke and we would have been born in the Garden of Eden? 
Could you imagine what it would be like today if all of a sudden Teresa said to me, Eli, where are you going? Oh, man, you see what time it is? I'm going to walk with God because this is the cool of the day. I'm going to be able to hear him talk about the mysteries of the universe. You know what I love is that the garden is representative of paradise where we'll be in heaven. The thing that I love is that some people think that we're going to be floating around on clouds with little angels playing harps, and that's what the heaven's going to consist of. Heaven's going to be working. But you know what? In heaven, we're not going to sweat. We're not going to toil. We speak. There are some people believe that we don't even physically speak, but telepathically, we just think it. Because the Bible says, as a man thinks, so is he. You just think it, and all of a sudden, you know what? I don't even have to be able to pick up the phone and call Josh. I just think it, and all of a sudden, he hears me think it, and all of a sudden, he, hears, he thinks it, and I hear him think it. And, and, you know, and he's in his own mansion, you know, on the other side of heaven, and, and I'm thinking it, and he's thinking it, and we're talking back and forth. Just, that's pretty cool. I don't know if that's the way it is, but that sounds good to me. I'm sticking with it. But God wants to be able to break biological struggles, biological strongholds. The Apostle Paul said that there are strongholds that we've got to be able to deal with. You know, you have to pull down a stronghold. A stronghold is a perception, it's an attitude, it's a mindset. And you've got to pull that thing down. So what happens, you recognize that every thought has to be brought captive into the obedience of of Christ. So all of a sudden, when I turn and the doctor says, what's your family history? And you start telling them about your mother and your grandmother and your great-grandmother. Right then, you've got to take those thoughts captive. And you've got to be able to say, God, your blood is stronger than that, 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 that generational curse. Your blood is stronger than that physical disease. Your blood is stronger than that bloodline coming down. And I declare and decree that healing is your children's bread. I declare that thing ain't coming to me. It's not coming to my daughter. It's not coming to my granddaughter. It's not coming to anybody in my life because your blood is greater. You see, there's a a, a process. That's why we can't be just cavalier in pursuing God because every single day, the enemy of your soul, he gets up and his, uh, his objective for that day is to take you down. His objective for that day is to be able to plant seeds inside of your garden. His objective is to get you to believe some of these lies and allow those lies to begin to cultivate. And you know what takes place? They become a stronghold. They become like not just a weed out there in the yard where I can put some Roundup and kill that weed, but they become like great trees with great root systems. And the bigger they get, the harder it is to be able to deal with them. And all of a sudden, now they begin to affect with generations and generations and generations to be able to come. And you turn and you think, man, where did this thing get in? Sometimes it came through previous generations. Sometimes it comes through us. Sometimes the things that we say. But God says, no. Let the words of your mouth and the meditations of your heart be accepted unto me. You see, God wants us to identify some things. Remember I told you that you cannot conquer what you won't confront. And you won't confront what you won't identify. We've got to be real with one another. We've got to be real with the Word. We've got to be real with God. When you recognize some things. I was with David and Teresa at a function this past week. And I don't know what's taking place inside of my life. All I know is God is radically messing me up. Radically messing me up. This whole river thing. I think what I've been teaching you since the first of of the year is to be able to close the gap between your mind and your heart. You know, the Bible says that from your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. That word in the Greek is bowels, that your, the innermost being. So, so getting our heart, our subconscious, to be able to think godly thoughts, to get that thing down on the inside of us so there's a gap of 18 inches from your heart to your head, and God wants to close that gap. He doesn't want your mind to drive you. He wants your spirit to drive you. He doesn't want want you to see yourself based upon your thoughts or the words that have been planted inside of your mind or the doubt that you have inside of your mind. He wants you to see yourself based upon how he sees you, seated in heavenly places with all authority and all power. He's given you the ability to literally rule and reign on earth. And so we've got to close the gap. We've got to be able to recognize that sometimes I don't think correctly. Sometimes my thoughts are not godly thoughts. Sometimes I'm going to reach out and bless somebody in a Christian kind of way because of what they've done and what they've said. But that's not godly thoughts. And if I allow those thoughts to stay, they develop a stronghold. They develop seeds inside of me. You know, what's amazing is that there's been times where, if I can just be candid with you, I've always been pastoral. 
There's been times where, you know what, my kids have seen me lose my cool. Maybe say things, done things in front of them that, you know, I'm not proud of. And sometimes I've had to be able to go back and say, hey, I'm sorry. Because we're all in this process together. But you know, my wife and I will grab hands and we'll declare that, you know what, our kids are going to be blessed. They're going to exceed anything we can hope for or imagine. And I'm going to tell you something, as a papa, I am really proud of all three of my kids. I am proud of what God's doing in them and what God's doing through them. They're going to exceed anything that I've ever done. And you know why? Because Kelly and I chose to speak life. We chose to be able to plant life. Now, does that mean that some of our kids didn't go through crazy seasons? Well, they had a crazy papa. And yeah, they went through some crazy seasons. But you know what? We spoke life, 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 even in the middle of those seasons. We, be de- we began to declare the word of the Lord over their lives. And what's amazing is how God can cause things to be able to come full circle. He wants us to be able to deal with some things. He wants his blood to be able to break every ungodly cycle in our lives. Every ungodly season. He wants us to literally declare, like Joshua, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to choose from this moment forward to speak life over one another. My wife is here. My kids are here. My wife can tell you, we don't speak ugly to each other. I can count on one hand the amount of of major disagreements we've ever had in 30 plus years of marriage. Because we chose not to. Does that mean at times that she's not frustrated with me? No, she gets frustrated with me, Pastor. Now you tell her, don't you be be mean to my pastor. But but you know, that's, that's just life. But we choose to control the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart. And we choose to deal with it. We choose to confront that thing. And I know as a husband, you wives don't go home and tell your husband, did you listen to the pastor? But we are the kings of our home. We're the priests of our homes. We have to take responsibility of what's allowed into our homes and what's not allowed into our homes. And at times, if we've got to do some things in order to be able to bring harmony and peace into our homes, we've got to do those things. If we're constantly frustrating our wives, we've got to ask ourselves why. What are we doing? And let me just say something to you. I didn't read any book on 10 steps on how to be a better husband. I just asked God to help me. I asked him to set a guard over my mouth to help me to be able to reflect the very love of God, the nature of God, into my wife and into my family. And he's doing it. Does it mean I'm perfect? No. Does it mean that Kelly's perfect? Yep. I'm telling you what, I'm going to teach you how to live long on the earth. And so today I want to do some declarations over you. Today, I believe that God wants to be able to break some ungodly cycles. And can I just be honest? We all got them. We all have some things, some seeds that have been planted, some things that have been done, some things we're aware of, some things we're not aware of. And I don't know about you, but God's got a very unique way of, of, of helping us identify some things. You may not ever know the, 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 the if, the what, and the how. But all of a sudden, you just feel like, God, I got to pray for my great-grandfather. I don't know what happened. I don't need to know what happened. But God, any ungodly things that were done there that were passed down, to my father that was trying to be passed down to me, I just declare and decree, stand to your feet. But the blood of Jesus is against it. I got too much stuff up here anyway. We might do part two next week. Let me get you just to close your eyes and lift your hands to heaven. Repeat after me. Say, Father, I thank you for the blood of Jesus. I thank you for his death on the cross for the price he paid for my sin that breaks every curse off of my life. I apply the blood to every ungodly seed that I have planted or that has been planted with inside of my genealogy. I ask you to forgive me, Father. I choose to forgive even the sins of my forefathers, even the sins of my grandfather, even the sins of my father. And Father, I declare that your blood is being applied to four generations, past and and future. So Father, Lord, I apply the blood over my family, over my life, over my mind. Father, Lord, over every area of my life, I declare and decree 
that the cycle of sin is broken off of me, off of my family, that from this moment forward, I'm walking in the fullness of the power of the Spirit of the living God, bearing good fruit, good blessings, that all I put my hands to will prosper just like my soul prospers in you. I will be faithful to your word, to your will for my life. I declare that the curse is broken, that I'm a new creation, that the old is gone, and that the new has come. In Jesus' name. Now come on, put your hands together and let's begin to worship the Lord. Father, we thank you for the goodness and the greatness of who you are. We thank you, Father Lord, for the manifestation of the sons of God. We're thankful, Father God, that, Lord, that the new day, Father Lord, is the blessed day. And, Father Lord, from this moment forward, Father Lord, we're not walking with a limp, but we're walking with the fullness of the power of the kingdom of God. As we begin to bring your love, as we bring your light, as we bring, Father God, your authority into the earth. Now, Father God, I pray that, God, every one of us will be carriers of the light to help those that are in darkness find their way back home. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Listen, Wednesday night, life group, if you're not coming, you need to be coming. If, if, you, if you're coming up with, how many of you got excuses on Wednesday night? You know, you come home from work and you're tired. But I'm just telling you, something is happening at our life group on Wednesday night. David and Teresa, God is using them incredibly. And you know what's taking place is that some of the, the crust of the old is getting knocked off. People are stepping into the fullness of what God has called them to be. Amen? All right, come see Debbie over here, all you ladies.